This is uh, lecture two of chapter two, and we're talking about neurobiology and behavior. In the last lecture, I was just talking about sort of the big picture. We talked about um, uh, concussions and looked at that pretty cool picture. These next couple slides, well, there's actually several of them. The next couple slides um, I use as a way of, of, sort of illustrating the, the, the basic regions of the brain and the brain structures. So you may have heard of or may be familiar with the concept of hindbrain, forebrain, and midbrain. I don't find that to be a very useful way of remembering brain structures, of understanding them. Those terms, I mean, there, there is a hindbrain, a forebrain, and a midbrain, but those terms come from not the fully developed adult brain, but the process of neurological development. So at our early stages in our development of neurological development, our brain, base, our brain and spinal cord, our central nervous system, begins basically as a tube. And that's what this is here. This is your neural tube. And the front part of the tube, um, the fore brain, becomes all of this pink area here. So it becomes your cerebral cortex. It becomes the outer foldy part of the brain that we traditionally think of as brain. The yellow part, the midbrain, it becomes, and you see how it, as the brain develops, right, it becomes um, some of the sort of the top regions between the spinal cord and maybe your limbic system, but it's sort of, sometimes I think of them as the guts of the brain, but not exactly, because some of the structures in the middle of the brain are associated with the forebrain. And then the hindbrain, right, theoretically the part here in the back, this becomes like down here, the base of the brain stem or the top of the spinal cord. And then finally, the very back part here, the blue part, this is what becomes the spinal cord. And it just doesn't make much intuitive sense as far as a way of organizing if you're trying to remember where the structures are at. But it does, tell, it does um, illustrate the sequence or the placement, the structural placement in brain development. What I find more meaningful, if I want to try to remember this stuff, and, um, and the way I, yeah, what I find more meaningful is another analogy that's referred to as like the old brain. So the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the human brain. And this analogy helps us keep them separated in terms of what the structures do, what the functions are. And the idea is that, that these animals, reptiles, mammals, and humans, they have increasingly more sophisticated brain processes. The reptilian brain is fairly simple and fairly small. The mammalian brain is a bit more sophisticated and the human brain is even more sophisticated. So I think of it kind of like this. When the mother sea turtle, when, she, when it's time for her to lay her eggs, she follows her pre-programmed behavioral processes that we refer to as instincts. She gets out of the ocean, she digs a hole in the sand, she lays her eggs, and she goes back to the ocean. That's it. She's following this very simple uh, biological process. The mother cat, though, the mammal, the mama kitten, she knows, uh, she anticipates uh, where she's going to have her babies. She knows how many kittens she has. If her kittens are in danger, she will move her kittens. And she will probably notice if you take one of her kittens. She is bonded. She has more connections, um, more bonding, more nurturing relationship with her children. She's got a few more sophisticated brain structures, right? Specifically, the limbic system, which I'll talk about in a second. The human mother, the human mother, however, she anticipates even more what she has. So the mammal, the mammalian brain, are these very basic primitive brain structures in the back. The sorry, reptile, reptile. The mammalian, the cat, kitty cat brain, she's got some of the structures in the middle of the brain that are um, related to fear and learning and emotions and attachment, the limbic system. And what the mother has, what the human has, is she has the frontal lobe. 
the part of the brain that's involved in planning. So human mother, she anticipates the birth of her child. She prepares uh, the nursery. She even prepares a college account. She's so forward thinking, hence the term for brain. Um, whereas the lizard, you know, she's just operating by her lizard brain. So it's sort of this idea that there's some very basic primitive structures, your cerebellum, your breathing, your swallowing. You have some more sophisticated structures, which are about memories and learning and attachment in the middle. And then in the front, you have these very sophisticated brain structures for planning. So this is um, another image of the same thing, right? You have the forebrain that becomes all of the folds. You have the midbrain. This becomes like your limbic system. This would be more like a mammalian brain. And then your basic primitive structures are towards the back here. Um, I threw this slide in a couple years back, um, partly again out of curious, personal intellectual curiosity, but my but also to illustrate, um, to illustrate some other points that were kind of popular at the time. So when my child, when I was pregnant with my child, I had an amniocentesis, and that's the needle that's injected into your belly. And what the doctors were looking for was something called a neurological tube defect or a neuro tube defect. Thinking back to this image, this is the neural tube. What they wanted to um, rule out, and, and they did rule it out, was that the fluid that should have been protecting the neurological tube, the same fluid that's going to condition, that's going to cushion the brain against the skull, that there was somehow an opening in this neurological tube and this fluid was where it wasn't supposed to be. So they stuck the needle into my abdomen to see if there was neurological tube in the um, in the sack, and there was not. But conditions that they were trying to rule out were conditions like these. One of them is, and you may have heard of this, spina bifida. And spina bifida is where there is an opening in the spine, so the spine is supposed to be covered by bone. And when this doesn't happen, obviously this is an abnormal, this is an abnormal condition, but the spine can protrude out of, um, excuse me, yes, the spinal cord can protrude out of the, oh gosh, the, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm, the bones that are supposed to protect it. And this can um, impair development. Or it would, that would be spina bifida or something called encephalocele. And what encephalocele is effectively the front, these, the, the other brain structures, the very basic, the lizard part of the brain, it develops but the rest of the brain does not develop because of some, some error in the programming. I remember as a child, my mother would make bonnets for babies born without brains, and I didn't quite comprehend what that was, but that's what this is. And so the question that I sometimes ask and like if we were to have a conversation is, imagine your child was born or you know a child being born with the basic structures that allow them to breathe and to swallow but they don't have any structures that will allow them to form memories or to feel emotions or to see right theoretically as long as this child was getting nourishment the body that child could live um, because the basic structures for swallowing breathing and balance those are in the back and all of this stuff up here, that's what makes us quote unquote human. Um, another example of this one is an encephalocele, and that is similar, it's kind of like spina bifida, except in this case, the, the neurological tissue, the actual brain is born, it, I'm sorry, is formed outside the skull. So they may have a, a skin, may cover it, but the bone doesn't cover their brain. In most cases, this is repairable, I understand they're actually occurring some of them in the womb. Um, yeah. And then another, um, you maybe you remember Zika when they were talking about Zika virus. And Zika, uh, I want to tell, I, I probably pick this up in the next 10 minutes, but Zika virus, oh, phooey, I'll just cover it anyway. Um, the, one of the consequences of Zika virus is what was called microencephacele, and that's 
actually what it means is tiny brain, right? Micro. So here would be a typical brain size or head size. And then a child who has micro encephalocele head would have a very, very small brain. And the way that works, and I, you know, it's one of those things I didn't take it seriously until I started learning a little bit more about it. And holy cannoli, it's scary. And the way that it works is the virus, remember it was transfer, it's sexually transmitted and transmitted through mosquitoes, is that depending on, it was particularly dangerous for women of reproductive age because the virus would take over tissue that was supposed to become brain tissue. So if a woman became infected with Zika at conception, that would mean that all of the neurological tissue, all of the neurological resources that would have gone to grow the baby's brain, right? To grow um, brain tissue. Instead, that those resources are used to make virus. And so that would mean that the skull might be very small and not filled with brain matter at all, but instead be filled with virus cells. And so you end up with a very small brain and depending upon when she was infected, it could be worse for, um, for her developing child. If, the chi if she was near nine months, if she was nearly near the point of delivery after the brain had already formed, then it was, would be less problematic than it was at the beginning when only a little bit of the brain was deformed. And what this is here is it just talks about which parts of the brain were primarily affected by, um, by the Zika virus. So it's, it's scary. It's scary that, and especially given that they, they learned that it was also uh, sexually transmitted. Okay, well, that's really depressing. So I'm gonna wrap this, um, this video lecture up here. We've talked about neurological tube defects and neurological tube development and some of the brain structures. When I come back, I think we'll start just jumping right in by some of the um, central, some of the pieces, some of the structures in the brain and the spinal cord or the central nervous system.